society, I'd like to welcome all of you. And of course, our speaker for today, uh, Muhammad Asim Subhani, for uh, joining us on this webinar on demystifying Pakistan's oil and gas potential. Um, before we begin, I'd like to run you through a few housekeeping rules. Um, this webinar is for an hour, and uh, we request all the participants to please stay muted for the session and keep the videos turned off. Uh, we will host the question and answer sessions at the end, and uh, you can type in your questions in the chat box. Uh, which will be later taken on. Uh, please do, um, uh, the, this session will be recorded and will be shared with you. And at the end of the session, we request you to please fill the feedback form that we share with you. So uh, without any further delay, I would like to hand over to uh, the president of the CAV Society of Pakistan, Mr. Sajjad Denver, who's also the CEO of AWP Investments. Uh, Sajjad, sir, please, for your uh, welcome remarks. So you're on mute. Assalamu everyone. Uh, on behalf of CFA Society Pakistan, a very warm welcome to all the participants uh, who are joining us from different locations. Uh, thank you very much for making time out of your busy schedule to attend this webinar. Um, we are very honored uh, to have with us uh, a highly distinguished uh, guest speaker, Mr. Uh, Muhammad Asim Subhani. Sir, I'm very grateful to you for uh, taking the time, accepting our invitation and to speak on this uh, very, very important topic uh, that is uh, titled uh, the, uh, Demystifying Pakistan, uh, Pakistan's oil and gas uh, potential. Um, the seminar will focus on ENP uh, life cycle and with a particular focus on Pakistan's hydrocarbon potential as the title mentions. And, and the speaker will also touch upon the key dynamics that can help uh, Pakistan to unlock its hydrocarbon uh, potential. Um, I'm sure that you will uh, find this webinar, uh, this web that will be very, very insightful and interesting, and you will enjoy this session. Uh, without any delay, I will uh, hand over the floor to uh, Mr. Muhammad Asam Subhani uh, for his presentation. And after that, uh, as it is announced, there will be a Q&A session that will be moderated by uh, Mr. Asif Ali Qureshi. Uh, over to uh, Mr. Asif. Uh, Assalamu alaikum ji. Uh, I hope uh, you can see my slide. Uh, if, uh, if, if everything is okay, I can continue. Yes, it is, uh, please, thank you. Okay ji, thank you ji. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the CFS Society for inviting me for this uh, 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 webinar, uh, which is uh, uh, are trying to understand the basics uh, of the Pakistan oil and gas potential. And I'll start with uh, something on the global sides and try to uh, tell you from, from the explorer's point of view, let's call it, because uh, we, the technical people, what I understand is uh, that uh, we sometimes go more in the technical sides and we uh, try to forget about the business side of this uh, oil and gas. So I'll try to cover a little bit uh, both sides and just the educational back, uh, 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 let's call it an educational uh, webinar in order for you to understand uh, the oil and gas potential of Pakistan. So uh, it's, it will be a very basic uh, uh, on the petroleum system how to explore so that is uh, i'll try to explain it uh, in a very simple let's say words so that uh, i understand that uh, we have the audience which are uh, mostly non uh, 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 exploration sites so they are mostly from the finance background so it's a it's a talk basically which will uh, which will try to explain how the exploration is basically done so this is the map of Pakistan, as you can see. Uh, on this map, uh, you can see that uh, I have tried to put uh, uh, the digital elevation model. So you can see that uh, this area is the like flat area. And then this is the Kether fold belt area. Then we have the uh, Suleiman fold belt area. And then uh, as we go that uh, in the north, uh, we have the uh, Kohat, Potohara area. And on the Western side, we all know that we have uh, our uh, uh, Balochistan, uh, which is there. Uh, 
So first of all, I would like to tell you that, of course, in any uh, petroleum system, uh, we need to understand uh, the geology from where this, uh, 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 this uh, our uh, Pakistan is basically made of. And uh, we would like to understand how the geology uh, is being uh, uh, made uh, uh, and how the petroleum system is evolved uh, in that uh, geology. And um, in this, the most important, of course, uh, is uh, try to uh, understand where is the trap which uh, is required to, to get that uh, petroleum or hydrocarbons. So uh, here is on the left side, you will see the picture where you can see that um, there is a uh, oil and gas uh, in different uh, rock formations, what we call rock formations. And we try to explore where it is a well can be drilled in a place where you will not find any uh, hydrocarbon and uh, we may miss by a couple of hundreds of meters or whatever. So this is a perfect example uh, uh, of uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, in a well, you can uh, find hydrocarbon if you drill at the right spot or you, you may not find it. And uh, once you have the failure, uh, all the markets, uh, all the people, they, they start to say that the petroleum system in that area is not working. But this is not, uh, may not be correct. It may be correct, but it may not be correct. So in, uh, in all over the world, the oil and gas is of course considered as a high risk and of course a high reward uh, uh, business. Uh, and there is a, a very, uh, let's say long process uh, where the risk uh, is uh, mitigated by doing certain things, uh, let's say for certain uh, uh, studies uh, based on the data which is available in that area. And we try to mitigate uh, our risk uh, based on that. And geology is the basics of everything. Geology uh, will uh, postulate a model of the subsurface where the surface geology and the well data is being uh, in, uh, uh, collaborated. And uh, then you start to build a model. And uh, here comes the explorer's mindset where he tries to understand how the model is being made, uh, what are the regional bases, what are, which are the main important things. And uh, there could be places where only geology cannot be helpful also. And I'll try to explain in our coming slides. So in any petroleum system, there are uh, basically, uh, we can, uh, I have put together, let's say seven key elements, which are important. So one thing we need to understand itself is the source rock itself. The source rock is the rock which is rich in organic matter. And that is basically put under certain conditions of pressure and temperature. And the, these rocks uh, just then start to generate the hydrocarbons in very small quantity. And it goes into the reservoir rock. And reservoir rock is the rock where the hydrocarbon has been captured. So this is the natural process uh, how the oil and gas is being, uh, let's say, generated first of all, and it captured in the reservoir rock. So two things are important to understand here, that there is one thing which is called source rock and the other is reservoir rocks. So uh, there are two different types of rocks. So this is important to understand that when we are dealing with any petroleum system, we are talking about the source rock and the reservoir rocks separately. And we need to understand where is the source, where is the reservoir. And this is important. And the third important point is the seal on top of it. So as you can see on this uh, picture, the gray, gray line, uh, the, the gray box here, you can see that this is the seal of that uh, 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 reservoir, which prevents the hydrocarbon not to go away from that. So this is also very important in some of the wells where we have got the source, reservoir, everything. And if the seal is not there, of course, uh, the, the, this will be called as a failure. But the reason for the failure of that particular well 
would be the sealed rosk. Then of course, the maturation is the very important part. So you may have got source, reservoir, seal, but the source rock is not matured and it may take another million years, let's call it, to mature and then it will uh, produce the hydrocarbon. The fifth important part is the migration and migration is basically the, the path where uh, the, uh, the source rock uh, generates and it goes into the reservoir uh, rocks. So this is a process where the hydrocarbons in very small, small quantities, it goes, it, uh, it expels from the source, source rock and it goes and move into the reservoir rock. Then uh, the sixth uh, uh, key element I would say is the trap itself. So you may find a, a reservoir rock, but if the trap is not working, the reservoir, the, the hydrocarbon will keep on flowing and it will go, go, go away. So we need a accumulation of the hydrocarbon there and it should be in a commercial uh, quantity so that uh, we can call it a commercial success, which is producible. So the trap is very important uh, and uh, there are ways how to de-risk that trap. And I'll try to explain it in my coming slides. The last uh, and the most important of course, is the timing also. So you may have source rock, it may have produced it, it may have the reservoir rocks. If I have all the above six points, which I'm mentioning here, but if the timing of that is not correct, so meanings that if everything is fine and the trap itself is not built at that time when the source rock was generating hydrocarbon and trap is built at a later stage, that means that the hydrocarbon cannot be accumulated at that point in time. So the timing of all these elements is important. So you should have a perfect timing when the source rock is made. You should have the reservoir also there, seal also there, should have been matured enough, should have the migration it should, uh, would be there. And finally, the trap should be also there because if the trap is not there and the timing of the trap itself is not there, then it's a problem. That means that all the systems uh, was working except for the timing, meaning that the trap was uh, made uh, uh, later when everything was gone. And today we are seeing the trap itself in today's time when we go and uh, the trap is there, but it is empty. So this is also sometimes uh, uh, the cases uh, which uh, uh, tells us that there's the failure of the uh, 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 well itself or the exploration is not uh, really good there. So um, in all over the world, uh, I would say, uh, as I explained before also, uh, that uh, in any country, in any continent, in any area, whenever you go, there's a new venture group, which uh, starts to evaluate the basin, uh, which means that how the basin is being uh, 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 made. We have the place screening processes, and then once we go there, we have started to go to the exploration phase where we have the prospect generation. The uh, Once the prospect is matured, so all these technical works are being done, then finally we look at the well to be drilled, which is called the exploration well. And once the exploration well is drilled, then there is a appraisal and the planning of all the field development and everything, which uh, tells us the uh, area which is called, uh, which can be considered as a pool, which is uh, uh, a field. And finally, we have the field development uh, and finally the production itself. So what is important here is that the first step and the hard step and the big step is uh, to decide where to explore first. And uh, I, I have put it here the exploration part. Uh, so the most important part is where to explore. Uh, in order for us uh, to, uh, to understand the subsurface models, we uh, explorers, or we may call it ourselves geoscientists used to use all the, the types of data which is available. And they could be uh, 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 hard data, which can be obtained from uh, 
the seismic and the wells. So the rocks which are, are present there, we, we used to have some wells control from the previous wells which are drilled there. And we start to uh, build our models on the seismic data. There could be some extra, some other uh, information, which is basically the outcrops, the regional geology, and the concepts uh, based on the magnetic uh, and the gravity data. Because our Earth is basically trying to give you a lot of information once we start to put uh, 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 some, uh, let's call it, surveys on it. And uh, seismic is one of the basic tools which is being used in order to explore the oil and gas. Once this all data set is done, we, we go back and we try to see the risk uh, uh, and the volume assessment. And uh, there is, of course, a critical link between the geology and the business uh, uh, of the oil and gas, because if uh, the possibility of success, you will start to hear this, num uh, this thing uh, very common in our industry, uh, is is very important number, uh, which is required uh, for any business decision itself. Uh, so all the technical evaluation, which is based on the ge geological and the geophysical work, is basically telling us uh, two things. Uh, one uh, is the uncertainty of the volume itself, and also the uh, the uh, the risk associated with it. So we, by doing our studies and models and all this work, we try to understand what, what could be the possible volumetrics of uh, that particular play, for, for example, or a prospect or a well or whatever. So meaning that in case of uh, success, how large or how small could be our uh, uh, discovery. And uh, of course, uh, there is a risk associated with it. So all these key elements that I have previously discussed, those seven uh, has, has a number there. So we may say that the risk associated for the trap itself is less because I can clearly see that the, uh, the hydrocarbon will be there, but there could be a risk of the source. So all these things are basically there and a good company is the one who, who can uh, undertake all these uh, uncertainties in its uh, uh, assessment before uh, embarking on the exploration and production uh, project, any exploration and project, uh, uh, um, production project. So, so these are the very common things which are being used. Uh, and uh, these are the effective uh, uh, work uh, which is being uh, used in order to understand, of course, that in case of a success, uh, how we are going to uh, produce from that uh, particular uh, well itself or the field. Of course, uh, I try to put some pictures uh, just to uh, give you the idea that uh, what we are talking about. So the, these are the outcrops. Uh, the outcrops is just telling you the same outcrops are basically in the subsurface also. So our basics uh, for uh, any key exploration project is to understand and to see uh, the know-how of the subsurface. And uh, we, uh, the key for this success uh, could be first of all is the human resource itself. Their experience, their skill set, their competency is very important because uh, in today's world, the technology is moving and uh, we need to understand uh, that uh, behind any technology or uh, we, uh, the brain, human brain is something which is very important. And of course, the human resources should have a vision because there could be uh, something which according to one person can be very uh, different than uh, the concept of the other person. Because if you have seen the different basins of the world where the producing hydrocarbon is being produced, then uh, you can connect those and try to uh, duplicate that concept uh, in your area also. And uh, the know-how of the surface, subsurface is very important, not only at the regional scale, but also on the prospect scale. Um, finally, 
finally, uh, after doing all these technical words, of course, uh, the, the basics is that uh, we need to make a business. If it is a business model, if uh, putting all the risk associated with it and uh, putting all the cost and everything, if, if the, our EMV is uh, positive, then uh, th that means the business is, is, is good. It has its own risk, but ultimately, if there is a success, it will fly. Uh, here, I would like to tell you something about the uh, production itself, the world production, world gas uh, production. I would like to share some, some graphs here. And uh, uh, we need to understand that uh, you know, for Pakistan, though, we are always saying that we are uh, declining and it's correct, we are declining. But at the end of the day, compared to the world, we stand at uh, number 26 in the da daily gas production per day. So we are not so bad. Of course, we need to improve uh, as always, but uh, the, this is the number graph showing that we are uh, producing uh, around three to four BCF per day. Uh, this is uh, one of the graph that I would like to uh, share with you. Uh, the next, uh, uh, I'm talking about the gas reserves. So the world gas reserves. So in the world gas reserves also, we are number 30th. Uh, so I just put uh, the graphs of all the countries uh, which are producing uh, at the moment. Uh, so uh, 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 for example, Russia, we are talking about uh, around 1700 TCF, they have the reserves. Of course, our reserves are, are less uh, uh, currently as of now, but uh, we used to have uh, big reserves numbers and we have produced, of course, the expiration part is not there. And that's why we, we are uh, uh, not uh, adding those reserves here. And I explain you in the coming slides uh, why it is that. I put only for the gas reserves and gas production graphs because uh, oil, uh, because oil is, uh, uh, something that uh, we are, uh, 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 the geology says that the oil uh, is less uh, compared to the gas here. And there are, uh, there are some uh, technical uh, work done on that, and uh, which is telling us that the oil pools are less compared to the gas. Uh, but in terms of gas, we are, we are pretty good. Now I'll, I'll move something on the oil and gas uh, history. What is the oil and gas history of Pakistan and where the main producing areas? So this is quite a interesting thing for, I believe uh, for all of you, which will help you to understand uh, about uh, Pakistan. So here I, I, I put some numbers also. So uh, if, you, if, if you understand uh, the map of Pakistan in the North, uh, you will have uh, mostly uh, uh, wells drilled. So all these red dots are the places where the wells are being uh, drilled. So we are talking about uh, around uh, 1400 wells, uh, exploration wells. Uh, here I'm talking about the exploration itself wells, uh, which are being drilled uh, in different basins of uh, Pakistan. So you can see that in the north, uh, we have the wells drilled and in the south, in the Sindh area, and especially in the border of Sindh and Balochistan, there are wells there. There are a few wells in the Punjab also. But the most important part is that most of the area on the western flank uh, of Pakistan, which is Balochistan, of course, uh, is, is uh, very few wells are drilled there. And of course, in the, in the offshore area also, there is very few wells which are, are being drilled. So uh, uh, in terms of the production itself, uh, from the oil production point of view, so around 66% of uh, Pakistan's oil production is coming from the north area, uh, which is uh, in this uh, green blob, and 33% from this uh, green blob. And then uh, uh, around, let's say, 60% of the, our gas production is coming from this uh, lower Indus and the middle Indus area. And I'll explain you what is lower Indus and middle Indus in the coming slides. But uh, uh, this is uh, uh, area where most of the exploration work is being done. Uh, of course, in the western part, uh, in this blob, we have the uh, Kirthar uh, fold belt, uh, and of course, uh, here we have the 
uh, Suleiman Fold Belt, where around 30% uh, of our gas production is coming from there. One important part uh, which I would like to explain uh, or, uh, or tell you that uh, the, our <clears throat> oil and gas history, uh, the expiration uh, history of Pakistan goes way before uh, the, our independence in 1947. So the first well was, uh, which was drilled in today's Pakistan was Kundal. It was drilled uh, just uh, seven years after the famous Colonel Drake's uh, well, which was drilled in Pennsylvania, where the boom of uh, the oil and gas or the hydrocarbon is coming. So our area was uh, 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 quite uh, considered to be quite prospective uh, in the very initial days also. And the first oil discovery, which is coal, uh, also in the north, uh, is uh, drilled back in uh, 1913. And uh, by the way, uh, before we get uh, Pakistan, uh, we have 50 wells which are drilled uh, pre-partition, approximately 50 wells in different parts of Pakistan, today's Pakistan. One important part uh, which we, we should uh, thank God uh, that uh, the first giant gas discovery was done right at the birth of Pakistan uh, with the name of Sui, we all know that that was in 1952 and uh, it has uh, got 13 TCF reserves. And uh, as I explained you before that uh, these red dots are approximately 1400 expiration wells. So in the onshore area, we are talking about, uh, as we all know, Pakistan total area is around uh, 800,000 square kilometer approximately, out of which the offshore area uh, separately, we have around uh, uh, 280,000 square kilometer, where we have drilled 15, only 15 expiration wells. And uh, the, in the shallow offshore, uh, we have drilled only 12 expiration wells. And in the deep, we have three expiration wells. So uh, in conclusion, what I would like to tell you here is that uh, if you see the, the density of these uh, wells, it is very focused in few areas. So uh, I would say that more than 70, 75% of Pakistan land area is unexplored. And of course you can see the, uh, the offshore is uh, very under underexplored and uh, it needs to be explored. Um, in our petroleum Pakistan petroleum policies, uh, these are the zones which are there. Uh, there are reasons for making it because there are zones which are medium to uh, high, high cost. It, it, it is a relationship between the uh, risk and the cost also. So uh, all these zones are being defined. It's pretty uh, good, uh, let's say, work which is done uh, uh, by the government itself. So these zones are there. The prices... Uh, 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 pr price regime is also different for, for different zones itself. Um, here comes the geological basin map. So if you remember in the start of my presentation, I said that we need to understand the geology itself. So while understanding the geology, uh, uh, in Pakistan, we have different uh, geological, uh, let's say, basins. So these are the basins which are uh, which we have got uh, um, uh, due to because the basin is telling us that different rocks are there. So these rocks uh, may be producing from one level and maybe not be producing from the other level. So uh, in the green. Uh, on top of it, for example, number one, three, five, eight, and nine. These are the, let's say, five famous uh, uh, producing, let's say, basins. So these eight and nine are the producing basins, the most producing basin. And then number one is the more producing basin. All other basins uh, in uh, which uh, we have the geological basins, uh, we have room to explore. And uh, this is something uh, very important uh, for us to understand. Okay, uh, in the rocks, uh, one of the most important part is uh, to, uh, to understand where could be the 
uh, how how basically the rocks are being uh, deposited and at different uh, time scales. So when we are talking about the geological time scale, we are talking about millions of years. So if you see, I uh, uh, basically I try to put main three, let's say zones. So we have the Paleozoic rocks, Mesozoic rocks and the Cenozoic rocks. And uh, here I have put the uh, different, let's say the basins here, the Kohat and Potuhar, Middle Indus and offshore, Kirtan and Suleiman and Balochistan and Makran offshores. So if, if you understand that in, for example, in the Kohat Potuhar, we can have uh, Cambrian rocks also, which we are talking about 500 million years ago, which are being deposited 500 million years ago. So we can have uh, something of that age rocks, which can be drilled also. And sometimes we can have uh, uh, this Mesozoic uh, era where we are talking about 66 to let's say 65 to 250 million years ago. So these are the different types of rocks which are present and each type of rock they, uh, for in different basins, we can have hydrocarbon there. And there is a big geology involved in it. I, I will not go into the detail of that. But the most important part is that uh, this just gives you the idea that uh, once we are seeing any data set uh, or any geological outcrop uh, or the seismic data or uh, the well data, we are talking about millions of years which have uh, basically uh, there in order to uh, produce the uh, finally the hydrocarbon. One very important part uh, is to understand, I'll try to explain something on the conventional and the unconventional part. Uh, the conventional part uh, is basically uh, we, we need to understand that we can have shallow and deeper potential of the existing fields. So there are existing fields, as you know, for example, SUI. Uh, and there are uh, many others which are uh, being produced by Pakistan uh, by different companies, of course. And uh, then we have uh, uh, in those fields, there could be some, some potential reservoir levels which are previously not thought about and which could be potential for uh, exploration. These could be shallows, these could be deeper. That's uh, quite common. And this is the really the process uh, where in all over the world, the companies used to focus on their, their main reservoirs at the initial stage. And then once the field is declining, you start to explore more but either in the shallow horizons or in the deeper horizons. One important part, as I mentioned also, that offshore uh, is of course very, very un, uh, uh, little explored. So we have only got, as I told you, 15 wells and uh, most of the wells uh, are drilled also in the old times. So uh, with the advancement of uh, all the technology itself, we uh, should have uh, something that uh, we have the, uh, we should know that our uh, offshore as this Indus Basin is the second largest uh, delta fan, which is uh, having 20 kilo, uh, 12 kilometer of sediment thickness. The meanings that these are the sedimentary rocks, which are important for any hydrocarbon to be there. So this is one of the basin where uh, there is no so far commercial discovery. And we must try to understand why it is and how can we make it uh, more prospective by getting more data and more analogy with the other basins of the world. And the most important part is that all of our other frontier regions where the density of the exploration wells are less, as I explained you in our previous slides, that uh, there are regions where the very few exploration wells are drilled and uh, we must uh, uh, try to build models, geological models, which can convince uh, ourselves and uh, uh, our uh, other companies also and try to investigate uh, 
the 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 subsurface uh, geology and ultimately the hydrocarbon is another uh, important part these are uh, we are talking about the conventional uh, potential of uh, the conventional hydrocarbon but there is also unconventional and i'll try to explain that uh, that there is uh, this type gas shale gas with some approximate numbers which are written there but these are just the probable numbers so we should not get excited once we uh, uh, saw these numbers so this is also important but uh, these are the possible probable numbers which uh, is based on some geological work or geological postulations let's call it this so uh, we, uh, I can say that, of course, uh, uh, the land area, almost all of the offshore is uh, uh, underexplored. In terms of the history, again, um, I'll try to uh, give you this chart, this famous chart, uh, which uh, we as a oil and gas industry or exploration uh, people, we, we, we know this uh, chart very common, but maybe for you, for any non oil and gas personnel, it's, it's maybe more useful to understand. So this chart is telling us that in back in, uh, the green dots are basically the oil, uh, uh, oil recoverable reserves and the reds are the gas recoverable reserves. So here on the x-axis, uh, we are talking about the years. So we are starting from 1900 until 2020. And here in the, on the y-axis, we are talking about uh, uh, cumulative recoverable reserves in million boy, uh, which is around, let's call it uh, 11,000 million barrel of oil equivalent. So you can see that at different points in time, we have our success. For example, in as I explained to you before, right at the birth of Pakistan, we have the uh, Sui, Sui discovery then, Later on, we have the Uch, uh, Mari, Kanthkot. And then there was a time when it was uh, quite flat. So there's not a, no major discovery at that point in time. And uh, <clears throat> suddenly we start to see Adi, Dodak, and Kirko. And then uh, here comes the Ka Kandra and Kadanwari. And uh, here comes uh, in the same years, more or less back in 90s, uh, we have the Loti, Dhakni, and the Mari Deep, and all these. And here, back in mid 90s, we have the Zamzama, Bhik, Savan, and Miano. And this screaming curve is keep on going there. And uh, it all depends that how, how much we explore. Once we say that how much we explore, it means that how much investment we put there. Of course, uh, it's, a, it's a risky investment, but we need to understand the geology of that area and if we need uh, if we understand the geology of that area then it may have some business sense uh, to persuade uh, any company any investor and in any investment to come back uh, here and do that uh, here uh, is just a table uh, just telling you that most uh, more than 70 percent of production uh, our current production is coming from uh, government-owned uh, entities which are ogdc ppl and mari and uh, there are few very few private companies which are there in terms of the unconventional gas uh, i've been i've been asked to put something on the unconventional side, uh, side so i try to put some uh, couple of slides on this unconventional uh, uh, gas so basically there are four types of uh, let's say kinds of uh, unconventional gas we call it the tight gas, uh, the coal bed uh, methane, the shale gas, and gas uh, hydrates. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain you uh, why they are called it like this way. So tight gas uh, are trapped in a low porosity and permeability uh, area. So porosities are basically, as the name says, it depends on the pores. So hydrocarbons are basically uh, stored in the reservoir rocks uh, in the pores. So if the pores are less uh, than uh, the gas trapped uh, in those uh, pores will also be less. And if the pores are not connected with each other, 
then the permeability of that uh, reservoir rock is also bad. So usually tight gas are considered to be the gas which is trapped within the low porosity, but and the permeability is also not so good. So it cannot be produced uh, from itself. And there are ways how to produce from that uh, reservoir rock. That's why we call it tight gas. Coal bed methane is also some uh, gas trapped in the coal beds. There's also very famous, uh, let's say, call it shale gas, which is which has been considered as uh, something important uh, also, that the gas trapped in the unconventional reservoirs. So the rocks which we usually don't consider it as a reservoir rocks, there could be some gas also trapped there, which is uh, something uh, we call it shale gas, which has very, very extremely low processes and permeabilities. And uh, there could be ways to achieve uh, this uh, shale gas from uh, drilling horizontal wells and some other st stimulation methods. There's gas hydrates also, this is also called uh, part of the unconventional gas. These are the frozen methane, which is uh, basically trapped uh, in, the, in the very shallow sections of the deep water offshores. In the world, you'll find these types of ga gas hydrates also. So uh, unconventionally, if, if, uh, if you see my picture here, you'll see that uh, these are the conventional types of rocks which are very easy to produce. It's only a matter of exploring it first. If you explore it, the porosities and the permeabilities and all other parameters are good, they will be there to very easy to produce. But there are places where the reservoirs are tight. So th these types of uh, gas uh, uh, will be trapped there and you need some extra effort in order to produce that. And especially from the tight uh, also, it will be more difficult to produce from the shale, shale itself. Uh, and of course, more difficult from the CBM, the coal bed methane. So what is the technical definition of tight gas? Uh, so the most important part is that the gas uh, reservoirs, uh, which are could be sandstone, could be carbonate, uh, which has some permeability. And this permeability, if, uh, if it is less than one milli Darcy, uh, it's, it's called that uh, it's not uh, producible. And it's, that's why it's tight because the pores uh, uh, which are connected with uh, this, uh, that's the word uh, uh, which we call it permeability. So if the pores are connected very nicely, then the permeability could be higher and it could uh, range up to hundreds of milli Darcy or even Darcy reservoirs. So these uh, are the usual conventional reservoirs, but here we are talking about gas reservoirs. So in uh, essence, whatever is less than one milli Darcy is called that. Then uh, of course, uh, there are uh, uh, many reasons uh, how, uh, how there are many uh, technologies available in the world where we can, uh, let's say, uh, do some, some extra efforts or some extra, let's say, capex, which, which is required in order to uh, produce from these tight reservoirs. But in the, uh, in the, in the world, we have examples uh, to do that. For example, uh, we can uh, have we can improve this uh, the well uh, productivity by drilling uh, horizontal wells, and uh, also doing hydraulic fractures, the multi fracture horizontal well bores. Uh, there there are uh, there could be multilateral well bores which can uh, be drilled, and we try to uh, stimulate that so that the permeabilities of that particular reservoir gets better and it start to produce from that. Okay, uh, I'm coming to the end of my slides. Of course, uh, one important thing which may help you to understand the, the oil and gas uh, cycle, that uh, back in, uh, this is example which I am quoting here for, from Norway. In Norway, uh, in the late 50s, very few people understand or believe 
that uh, there could be oil uh, or hydrocarbon uh, in uh, Norway, not only onshore, but also offshore. However, uh, uh, the discovery of the gas uh, in uh, the neighboring Nor uh, 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 Netherlands, we in 1959, uh, people have rethink and they started to understand that, yes, there could be potential there. And based on that, in 66, uh, they drilled the first uh, offshore well uh, in 1966. Of course, it was dry, the first well, and they couldn't get it uh, right. In 67, they, they have some shows, uh, and we call it uh, oil discovery, but it's uh, just a technical discovery, and it was not non-commercial. Um, and uh, uh, the first, uh, uh, commercial oil discovery was this Ecofesca, which was uh, drilled in 1969. But during these th three years, that is between 66 and 69, we are have uh, Norway has drilled 32 dry exploration wells. So uh, they keep on working, they keep on uh, evaluating their area, and finally they have a success. Uh, the first commercial success of Ecofisk. And from that day onward, here are the numbers which we are, I'm quoting here. Uh, uh, they, they are producing right now 4, 000, uh, 4 million uh, barrel foil equivalent per day, uh, out of which 50% uh, 50, 50, 50 gas and 50% oil. And they have the remaining reserves of uh, 45 billion boy. Uh, we as Pakistan, we still have to go and uh, do all this uh, exploration part, which is uh, uh, important for us in order to understand what are the indigenous resources that we have in our pockets uh, and try to produce from there. Um, I just put together some, uh, some important points uh, uh, for the ENP sector of Pakistan. So of course we have few strengths also, uh, uh, and with with the with the challenges. So in terms of the strengths, uh, demand supply gap, we have a big gap there. So I call it strength here because there there are countries where there there is a lot of uh, oil and gas there, but uh, for example Australia, uh, which uh, which uh, does not have the demand itself. So this I call it uh, as also a strength. This vast unexplored area. We have a mature regulatory framework. We have well-defined policies. The model agreements are in place. The guaranteed uh, offtake uh, from the state-owned buyers and even uh, is also there. The delivery at the is at the field gate. And of course, we have skilled human resource available, which needs to uh, be fully utilized. Uh, that's the, the uh, that is important. So I considered them as our strength. And uh, uh, the challenges, of course, uh, for these type of uh, extra, let's say, risky uh, business, uh, we need to have some law order uh, in the areas where we operate. So one of the basic reasons for not uh, exploring too much uh, in last 75 years is, of course, the law and order and the high security cost. In the areas where we uh, we could have uh, uh, explore in a effective way. The security costs uh, become so high that the companies start to shy away from their exploration uh, work programs. There are a few taxation uh, issues also that needs to be uh, uh, resolved. The time to market uh, in the ex unexplored basin uh, is of course an issue. And here comes uh, the government, uh, which uh, they need to facilitate and try to give more better, let's say, regimes in order to convince or give benefit to the investor that uh, they should invest there. Uh, of course, the delay in payments and the circular debts is the usual uh, 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 problems that we all as uh, 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 in, uh, in Pakistan we are facing. Uh, and uh, that, uh, of course, with the uh, hopefully with, in the coming days, it should be resolved. But uh, of course, there is a lot to work, and uh, 
uh, uh, we have areas where we could uh, uh, create models, geological models, technical work, and try to convince and take uh, take lead in drilling uh, exploration wells. And uh, this is important for uh, our industry. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm here for uh, any questions, please. Uh, Asim, thank you so much for this very wonderful and informative uh, presentation for breaking down this red, rather tricky and complex subject for us, especially the people who don't have the background technical knowledge. Uh, we are now open for question and answer session. Uh, all the participants, if they have any questions, they are free to write their questions in the chat, the chat box and send it to us. And we'll, we'll put those questions to Asim Subhani for, for his replies. In the meanwhile, uh, Asim, I've got two quick questions for you. You were part of uh, ENI for the longest time, uh, both within Pakistan and outside Pakistan. You, you were part of the team which led uh, the drilling of the famous or the infamous uh, Kekra well. So just want to understand what were your experiences from, from, from uh, that drilling effort? Uh, did, what did the data indicate? Uh, whether it was an absolute dry well, there was nothing found there. And secondly, a related question, slightly related question is why all the international oil companies, which used to be uh, very fairly active in Pakistan, uh, till the late 90s or early 2000s as well, have, have one by one left the country. Pass him over to you. Sure. Um, yes, uh, Asif, uh, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, regarding the offshore well, um, there are two things. Uh, as I explained, the petroleum systems have a few key elements. So in our offshore uh, uh, Indus, uh, the basic, let's say the risky part is the source rock itself. Uh, and uh, uh, once we drilled that uh, uh, Kekra well, for example, uh, we, we managed to get very good uh, source rock, uh, sorry, very good reservoir rock, but the source rock and the, uh, let's say the migration pathways uh, for that area was not uh, finally good. Uh, I mean, it was not convincing, and uh, the results are telling us that uh, the uh, the uh, the hydrocarbon has not managed to uh, to um, to get into that particular prospect itself, uh, because the prospect has a very good trap, uh, very good uh, reservoir rocks. We are talking about uh, more than twenty percent of porosities and everything. So. The, the biggest uh, concern for uh, offshore Indus is uh, the source rock uh, presence, not the presence itself, but the migration path phase also. Because uh, in offshore Indus, we have uh, uh, Pakan discovery. If you might know, or people might know, that there is uh, this uh, Pakan which was uh, drilled by, uh, 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 which was a, a discovery, uh, technical discovery, because it has flowed uh, 3 million scuff per day, 3.5 million scuff per day uh, from uh, Pakan well. Uh, so it is telling us that in that part of uh, Indus offshore, uh, at least the petroleum system is working. But in the Kekra, which is quite uh, ultra deep water, we are talking about more than 2000 meters of water depth uh, at that uh, particular uh, prospect itself, uh, we did not find that. So this is one part of the question answer to the one question. The second question is related to uh, the companies going uh, uh, away from uh, uh, Pakistan. And for me, uh, there they, they could be, uh, I, I can tell you uh, from ENI's point of view a little bit, but uh, the most important point is uh, the security conditions of Pakistan because uh, uh, the big companies, of course, uh, would, don't want to take any risk on the, uh, the HSE point of view. So the uh, security is one of their main, main concern. So uh, areas which are underexplored, one of the main reason, as I have mentioned here also, that uh, is the security. So 
uh, we should uh, put together, in my opinion, uh, all the stakeholders, which are, uh, are rather uh, the federal government, the provincial governments, uh, and also the, um, the tribal uh, tribes there. And we should sit, sit together and try to engage everybody and put a, a, a good understanding that uh, it is the need of the hour to, to explore. And uh, if uh, we keep on uh, uh, having uh, uh, problems uh, in terms of security, uh, no company will be able to uh, explore properly that uh, part. So I, I would say if you ask me one, one key uh, element why the companies are going away uh, is that uh, the companies are not, uh, let's say, um, uh, not confident on the, on the way uh, the security is being uh, provided. And the, um, and the other most important part is that the, the bid rounds uh, uh, should be more, let's say, frequent. So these are, I would say uh, that uh, uh, we should try to uh, have more frequent bid, bid rounds so that uh, um, companies should uh, 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 improve their portfolio in terms of uh, the areas where they are exploring. Uh, thank you, Asim. Thank you for, for, for uh, very detailed replies to, to my questions. Uh, you just a follow up question. You mentioned about security, but I understand security situation is not very helpful in a lot of uh, these African and, and Middle East regions as well. So why is it that these companies, some of the larger names, are still operating there in northern Pakistan? Uh, as you can say that those large com uh, companies, uh, because you you see in expression itself. First of all, is that we need to understand that uh, exploration, uh, the first wildcat, we, we used to call our word uh, wildcat. Wildcat is basically a well which is uh, drilled uh, first time ever in that particular basin, let's call it this way. So this is the well where you will start to understand the geology of the, uh, either it is a success or failure. But in those countries, uh, uh, they are there because they are producing from there and uh, they are uh, not uh, coming in this way that uh, they are exploring itself. Once you say that the companies are operating, it doesn't mean that they are exploring also. So they can have production only and uh, they, are, they, they may not have places to explore further. So in, in our country, uh, I would say that we have uh, uh, many, uh, let's say, uh, places which are unexplored. And then uh, uh, there is, of course, uh, no production from there because uh, any company needs, uh, in order to survive, they need a production there. So the production is the first, first point. So it's a cat, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a process. So first we need to do the risky business and then you start to produce once it's a discovery there. Okay, um, Asim, thank you very much for that. Uh, we've got uh, uh, some questions from the audience as well and I'll encourage them to send, send in more questions if they have them. Uh, first question is from uh, Mr. Abdul Wahab. He's asking in one of the slides regarding the exploration potential, you mentioned something about the second largest Delta fan. So can, can you, you know, elaborate a little bit on that, what exactly that means and how does that translate into uh, hydrocarbon potential? Okay. okay. So uh, exploration, as I explained you, the rocks um, is dependent on the sedimentary rocks. So there are different types of rocks, uh, as you might have known. Uh, sedimentary rocks are the uh, rocks which are basically uh, good for the hydrocarbon. So the sedimentary rocks are basically made by uh, the deposition from uh, the old, uh, let's say the paleo uh, rivers, which uh, finally uh, are deposited their sediments into, uh, into the basin itself or the places where the basin is opening up 
So the, uh, uh, the sediments are basically the key elements for that. Once, when I call it Indus fan, so as you know, Indus River is uh, taking all the sediments right from the Himalayas and uh, coming uh, down to the uh, offshore area, our uh, Arabian Sea. So it is uh, doing it for uh, many years, let's call it, uh, let's say a million years, uh, 60, 65 million years. So it is putting all these sediments and it is depositing in, in, in the offshore area. And uh, this once uh, we call it second largest because the first biggest uh, uh, fan area in terms of the area itself is uh, Bangala, Bangala fan. So Indus is uh, like this. Uh, of course, we have discoveries in Bengal, then there is Niger Delta, then there's Mississippi Delta, then there's Mahakam uh, Delta in Indonesia. So these deltas are the producing deltas. Uh, unfortunately, so far, uh, uh, Indus is not producing uh, hydrocarbon, but uh, because it has so much thick sediments of more than 12 kilometer, 12,000 meters, means that there is a potential there. And that's why companies uh, get very excited uh, once they start to see that because uh, we are blessed with this type of uh, sediments there. And uh, there is uh, the potential, the first, first question for any explorer is, to see that how much a thick sedimentary basin is present in that area. I hope I answered the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Asim, next question is from Dr. Shahid Rahim. Uh, he's asking, uh, his question relates to finding some potential oil and gas fields which are already emptied or soon, soon, or soon to be emptied for use as a medium to long-term storage of wind and solar energy, especially in Balochistan or Sindh. So based on your knowledge in this field and of the geography, are there some sites or fields that we can further explore to assess the prospects of compressed air storage of power generated from solar or wind, or wind plants during the off-peak hours and generating electricity and feeding it back to the grid uh, to offset some cost of generation surf peak demand? So are you, are you aware of this? Um, uh, I, I am really not very much aware of this, uh, this thing uh, because it's not part of... One thing I can tell you about uh, is the geothermal potential. So there could be geothermal potential uh, uh, for us uh, in some of our fields. So that needs to be explored also. That's a new, new concept that is uh, coming up uh, globally. And there is potential for that because uh, we, we are talking about the uh, uh, temperatures in our wells more than 160, meter, uh, 160 degrees centigrade. Uh, and uh, that could be used uh, as something to produce this steam there and then finally can be uh, produced uh, as a, uh, what you call uh, the power. So, but for the wind and solar, um, uh, our emptied field, uh, I, I didn't get the question right. Maybe it's not uh, my domain. So I'll, okay. I'll not answer on that. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Asim. Uh, next question is from Abdullah Omar Shah. He's asking that we get to hear a lot about Pakistan having sizable tight gas reserves. Uh, so nothing, but nothing has been found so far. So what are your thoughts about it? why we have not had uh, the kind of success that we expected or we should have had in that particular area. Is it the technology or the pricing? Um, there are two, three basic hurdles in it. First of all, we have the tight gas policy with us. So that is one thing. But the, the problem is that in that policy, uh, each particular uh, uh, well, it can, uh, has to be declared as a tight gas in order to get that policy itself, uh, that price, because tight gas uh, policy means that you need something extra on top of it on the current price scheme. So people uh, or the government, uh, we from different forums, we, we have been pursuing the government uh, to reconsider that any particular zone, uh, if it is uh, considered to be tight, uh, is that we drilled at different places uh, for, uh, and we found the same uh, less than one milli Darcy of uh, 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 
permeability, then uh, it should be considered as a tight gas and it should be uh, given that same price. But uh, for example, here, we need to go through and declare it through the third party certification and can call it uh, tight gas there. So it is not that we have not been successful, but uh, the, the success uh, means that uh, uh, there has been success there, but uh, uh, the companies are reluctant uh, not to invest anymore because uh, uh, once they uh, even explore, produce, flare uh, their uh, gas, uh, then they have to go through years uh, in order to get the price uh, confirmed from the authorities. So this is a long uh, process which uh, uh, nobody wants uh, and it's uh, something that needs to be revised. Okay, thank you. Uh, Moktadar Pureshisab is asking, in a nutshell, what are the reasons for shale gas not being explored in Lower Punjab in particular? Again, uh, that, uh, shale gas is, is, is uh, another uh, step forward. So first of all, we need to uh, understand the tight gas uh, and try to explore the tight gas first. Shale gas is another regime uh, where this, because the Nobody is going to drill a, 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 a let's call it independent shale gas uh, well because it's uh, it's not economically feasible because we can only have the wells which are already drilled and it has a potential of the shale gas so the shale gas as I tried to explain in my um, presentation are the uh, areas or the rocks which are conventionally not producible and it is considered that these are just uh, uh, the pathways where the hydrocarbon is coming out and usually we cannot uh, produce from them but the uh, shale uh, because the shale is considered to be something that uh, is not producible however there are technologies which are big uh, big amount of uh, let's say investment is required in order to uh, get that. But in my personal opinion, we should first focus on these tight gas and shale gas is the next step uh, uh, rather than going uh, directly to the shale gas. Because if we, we are successful in tight gas first, then uh, the shale gas is the next step and needs a lot of technology. And we need to make consortium of different companies so that we have some, some good, good work available so that the service companies can come and do some shale gas exploration. Okay, uh, thank you, Asim. Uh, Nurul Haq Saab is asking, uh, I'll paraphrase the question, that if the government decides to cut royalties for these oil and gas companies, do you think that that will incentivize them to up their ex ex uh, exploration activities? So that uh, you know, if, if the government improves your net backs, you think that you know that will help? Of course, uh, uh, this is something uh, we need to understand also. And uh, that at the end of the day, once we are producing indigenously any price of what we are getting uh, from the government, we are roughly giving back in terms of royalties and the corporate taxes around 50% of our revenues back to the government itself. So for example, if you are talking about $8, let's say, uh, number, which is, let's call it average number for our indigenous uh, gases, which we are producing, uh, we are getting, let's say, $5 or $6. So at the end of the day, we are uh, giving back around 60, uh, around 52% back uh, to the government in terms of corporate taxes and the royalties. And with these uh, declining fields, what we are producing, we keep on uh, even uh, uh, adding royalty payments. Uh, you are talking about, of course, uh, <laughs> decreasing this uh, royalty payments, but the government is is doing a little bit uh, uh, more harsh because, and this is really uh, destroying the industry also because uh, if you uh, 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 you need to incentivize wise. Uh, the, the declining fields by slashing down uh, these taxes and royalties so that the, the field itself remain economical because if the field is not economical, 
Of course, there could be hydrocarbon which is sitting uh, there and uh, it is not produced because uh, of all these uh, uh, royalty payments and all these other, let's say, extra things which are there. Okay. Um, a few months back, this is another question. A few months back, Mari drilled a horizontal well, which was first by any company in Pakistan. I'm, I'm not sure that's true, but uh, do you think that they are trying to tap tight gas in Mari field? Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not aware, aware of this, so I can't comment on it. Okay. I, I understand that Polish oil company is already uh, producing uh, gas using from the from the tight gas reserves. Is that right? Correct. Correct. So they have the field which is uh, considered to be the tight gas. Yeah. There are okay. zones there. Abdullah Saab is asking, what are the top three onshore regions at the moment in terms of hydrocarbon potential in the country? Top three. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, um, the most important part uh, is that um, uh, I'll go to my slide, which is uh, there. Uh, let me just go back. Uh, I hope I can find. Just give me a second. Here. Yeah. So, of course, I would say that where there is no drilling done, uh, that is where it is the most important. So, I, I'll not comment uh, which is uh, the ranking of that because uh, there are different reasons for that. Because if, if I don't have, for example, in this number four, which is the Pichin uh, Basin, only let's say one, one well is there. So, I, <laughs> it means that there's a lot to be to be explored. So based on that particular well information, I'll not, uh, I cannot compare these things and which is the best, which are the low. So this map is basically telling us that uh, there is very less work which is done uh, in this number four, six, and seven. So which is Pasheen, Haran, and Makran, of course. And of course, 10 and 11, which is the offshore. So in uh, let's say five also there are there are rooms which are there are places there are blocks which are uh, very let's say uh, conducive uh, from uh, very good from the technical point of view from the subsurface point of view of course in the in uh, this number three which is the Suleiman fold bed that's the one of the hot spot right uh, right now a lot of companies are working there so it is opening up and. Uh, 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 in between, uh, let's say one and three, this area, uh, these this this area is uh, uh, has recently got some good successes, uh, meaning that the petroleum system is pr proved there. So at the end of the day, I I'll not rank any anything, but uh, this map is self explanatory that uh, the more wells you drill, the more information you get and more refined you may become because drilling a well and if it is a dry well doesn't mean that the basin is is bad so you can you may have uh, as i explained it in my previous uh, slide you may have uh, for example uh, mm, uh, drill a well in this this location so you may uh, I, I, I did not understand very well and then you are uh, having problem Okay, uh, ask him one final question, uh, and that is, uh, how much time does it take? If this is from uh, Mr. Abdul Bahab. How much time does it take uh, in other countries for approval of tight gas pricing? And how does that timeline compare with Pakistan? So um, the problem is not the timeline, as I explained. Uh, the problem is that each well uh, needs to go and go through the whole process every time. That's the problem. So okay. uh, the, uh, the, the real thing is that whatever time you took or the government takes to consider it as a tight gas, that is good, should be good for one particular level or one per particular uh, reservoir itself. And uh, whenever you confirm that the permeabilities are uh, less than one uh, milli RC, then, then that should be enough. And uh, the tight gas policy should be given to that uh, well itself without any uh, losing time.
Okay, uh, Asim, uh, with that, uh, you know, I'd like to close the, the Q&A session. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time out and explaining and entertaining us with this wonderful presentation, which is highly informative, uh, personally for me as well. Um, you know, generally receiving a lot of good uh, feedback and an appreciation for, for your presentation. Uh, so on behalf of the audience as well, uh, I'd like to thank you and I'd like to uh, Thank the participants for, for, for taking the time out to participate in today's session. And just to close uh, uh, this session, I would like to request uh, Ms. Sarvat if she wants to have some final words. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Asim sir. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Kareshi, sir, who's our director, um, and thank you so much for all your initiatives and all your energy. Um, uh, please just please um, fill out the feedback. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Asim. Thank, thank you, you, Ji. Thank you. Thanks Love for you. attending. Thank you, Ji.